Hey everyone, how's it going? It's been a little while since I've made a video. I have been very busy and under a fair amount of stress. And so lately, uh, it's been just about all I can do to get a little bit of reading done every night on the week on weeknights uh, and on the weekends as well. It's just about all I can do to get some reading done and attend to my buddy reads without making a video. And so I just haven't had the energy or the headspace for making booktube videos. But this week has been much better than past weeks, and I feel like I actually have the energy to make a video today. So I thought I would sit down and just make a video talking about some of the books that I have finished uh, and am planning to continue reading or start reading. So I will start with a book that I finished just last night, and that is this, Ghost Hunters, William James and the Search for Scientific Proof of Life After Death by Deborah Blum. And this is kind of a popular history book about a team of researchers from various fields. Some of them were psychologists, like William James, some were physicists, some were chemists, others were non-scientists. But basically a team of intellectuals who decided to see if they could find scientific evidence. I'll say evidence, not proof, because science doesn't actually prove anything, which is just a, a little bit of a somewhat pedantic gripe I have with the title of this book, but scientific evidence for life after death. And that doesn't just mean ghosts, that also means like telepathy, uh, telekinesis, and other things. And these researchers basically follow as many leads as they can in searching for mediums who may not be frauds uh, and, and other phenomena. And what they find, basically, is that, you know, 99.9999999% of cases are pretty clearly fraudulent, are cases where the medium is fishing for information uh, with whoever's sitting with them, or the mediums, some, some mediums even, like, send out sort of pseudo-spies to find out information about the people who are going to come sit with them to bamboozle them with information that they may not have known. Uh, other mediums will, other teams of mediums or duos of mediums will sig signal each other with eye blinks or something like that. Uh, there are also people who will, you know, hook up strings to tables or chairs so that they can mimic levitation or will use sort of chemicals to create flashes or something to make it look like there's some something going on in the room. Uh, they combine that with like dimmed light uh, and they find that most of these cases are fraudulent, which is what you'd expect. But then there's always the like 0.00001% of cases where something really difficult to explain does happen. Uh, so the probably the biggest, strongest example would be the medium Leonora Piper, who would be able to tell things to people who even they didn't know. You know, that she would she would sit down with someone, tell them something about themselves that they didn't even know, and then they would go verify it, and they would find that she was right. You know, she would tell them things that she she could not have possibly been privy to. And the, certain of the certain members of the team did all they could to see whether she was somehow fishing, going out to find information. You know, she was actually followed by a detective for a long time to see if she was going places to find out information, and it turned out that she wasn't, or at least there was no evidence that she was. Uh, so. She would know things that she couldn't, and then she would also be sort of possessed by spirits, supposedly. Uh, so they were called controls, these spirits that would come and sort of possess her and speak through her. And they again would know things that they could never, that Leonora Piper herself could never have known. And occasionally she would be p possessed by someone who had recently died. And she would know things that that person would have known, but no one else right, again. And so these things happen that are just very difficult to explain, and there's a really remarkable passage in the book where Leonora Piper seems to be communing with another medium from across the Atlantic, I think, even, uh, with phrases in Latin, which is a language that Leonora Piper did not know, you know? So there are these things like this that are really difficult to explain. And so there's there's that one little kernel of evidence that there is something going on here. Uh, and 
so the book is really interesting looking at just how these investigators went about looking into these different cases, right? It's so interesting. Uh, and what I think is also really, really good about the book is it is a really powerful testament to how uh, one should never dismiss an area if there is some reason to believe that it holds water. So there, so she talks a lot about scientists who just dismiss this work, who just believed this work of searching for the supernatural to be completely, you know, a waste of time, that they, they thought that the researchers were all just being duped, that they were naive or something. Even when they were presented with very powerful evidence, they would dismiss it somehow. And I think what the book does well is it portrays the idea, the idea that you should always pursue knowledge wherever the data lead you, so to speak, right? Uh, you shouldn't just dismiss it if it doesn't meet, if it doesn't align with the, the view of the world that you currently hold, of course. Uh, and of course, that's a very scientific worldview, too to follow the data where it leads you, even if it's to a place that's very strange and outside of the realm of what you would expect. Now, where I think she does take some missteps is in her sort of borderline antagonizing of anyone who was skeptical. You know, she she's constantly banging on about scientists who had a hard time taking the work seriously, uh, but that struck me as really simplistic of her because, again, 99.99% of these mediums were frauds and most people knew it. Most, most thinking people knew it. And so it's not that unreasonable for a lot of, pe of smart people to take a look at that and think, well, clearly investigating that is not really worth my time. And, and I just wish she had not taken quite as partisan a tone against the scientists who had a, who were skeptical of this work. I mean, call me defensive, because I am a scientist and I uh, do not tend to believe in this sort of thing. And another aspect of this book that I would know is that I don't know that there's even really convincing evidence of life after death in this book, even though some remarkable things do happen. But I just wish she hadn't been as partisan in that sense. Because she, she, she seems to constantly just assume the worst in scientists who, t who d don't take the research seriously, but always gives the benefit of the doubt to mediums. In fact, she gives too much of the benefit of the doubt to some mediums, in my opinion. Uh, there are some mediums like the Fox sisters, for example, who are a, 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 a duo of mediums, who were actually found cheating, who were actually, you know, discovered cheating. And yet, for some reason, she continues to talk about them as though the, as, though, as though they should be taken seriously, right? Like, oh, maybe at one point they had medium-like abilities, but then lost them, so then they started to cheat. It's like, no, the, they were found cheating, so to my mind, the way that I would investigate this is as soon as you find a medium cheating, that's the end of the story, we move on from there, right? There's, an, there's, a, there's another medium uh, whose last name is Palladino. I can't remember her first name, but she's an Italian medium who also was frequently found cheating, would also produce really weird effects when she was un in full light and tied up or held down, but was still found cheating. And again, no matter what interesting st stuff she produces, as soon as you find a medium cheating, to my mind, that disqualifies them. So th there were some flaws in the book that I found that rubbed me the wrong way, but it is a really well-written book. The person I buddy read it, uh, Sharon Goforth, said that she couldn't, she had a hard time putting the book down. She just loved it that much. And it is a really gripping read. It is really well written. But I just wish it had been less partisan to some degree. I think I said in a message at one point to Jason from Old Booth Chapter and Verse, who loves this book, uh, that it struck me as quite sort of polemic against, like, scientists. And I would take that back now. I don't think it's polemic at all but it does strike me as partisan. So, anyway. Ghost Hunters, I would recommend it if this is of interest, because it's really well written, really easy to read. And I think does ultimately offer a very balanced account, because she also talks about, again, a lot of frauds, like Madame Blavatsky, who is a medium who was found to be fraudulent, and other, and other instances that uh, of fraud. And so, I think she does ultimately give a very balanced account uh, but there are just some aspects of it that rubbed me the wrong way.
So, anyway, hopefully that made sense, but that's Ghost Hunters. And now to talk about some books that are in progress and that I'm going to be continuing with soon. Uh, so a book that I am currently making my way through, I am about 115 pages into it, is David Blight's biography of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass probably needs very little introduction for a, a lot of you, but Frederick Douglass was uh, a man, an African-American man who was raised as a slave in the early 19th century who then escaped slavery and became this brilliant orator, writer, and a abolitionist, an activist. So this is obviously a biography of him, and it is so interesting learning about his life so far. This is not only a well-written book uh, by David Blight, but what comes out really well in the book too is Frederick Douglass's own writing. David Blight quotes from him extensively, from his autobiographies, from his speeches, and so on, and how brilliant Frederick Douglass was as a writer just comes out on every page, and it just makes me want to reread his narr narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass and read the rest of his work, because uh, it's just it's just magnificent. But it truly is a remarkable story. Uh, Frederick Douglass, in many ways, was lucky uh, to the extent that you could call someone born into slavery lucky. Uh, but by the standards of someone born into slavery, he was quite lucky in his life circumstances uh, that allow that eventually made it possible for him to escape and to be to learn how to write and these sorts of things. And what's interesting about the book as well is that any good biography will always be kind of, uh, you know, history of the times as well as of the person. And it's just interesting to me how, you know, almost 200 years later, we're still having a lot of the of similar conversations as we were having then in the United States. Uh, and that's really striking me now. And so this is great. I'm buddy reading this with three people. I'm buddy reading it with Peg from the History Shelf, uh, Patrice Jones, the commenter, uh, who, who I buddy read with a lot, and Bill Ruttenberg, or Rutenberg, sorry. Uh, and this is the first time he and I have buddy read anything. And they're all really smart people. Uh, Bill and Peg and, and Patrice read a lot more history than I do, so getting their perspectives is quite interesting. So this is a great read, but I'm chipping away at it. It's, it's a long book, obviously almost 800 pages, so it'll probably take me a, uh, take us at least the rest of the month, if not this month and next month. But anyway, this is great. I, you know, I'm only holding 100 pages in, but I, I'd say I'd recommend it. So there's that. Uh, tomorrow, a book that I want to start either today or tomorrow uh, in earnest, I have read the first like 10 pages, but I want to start really diving in, is Oscar and Lucinda by Peter Carey. Jason from Old Blues Chapter and Verse is hosting a read-along of this, and he's actually already posted the first video in the read-along, and will post the second one this Sunday. So I'm quite behind, but I hope to really dive in and uh, make, make headway in it. But I don't know much about it other than that it takes place in Australia, and is about a man named Oscar and a woman named Lucinda, who are both gamblers, who presumably developed some kind of a relationship. So. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I don't really have any impressions, because again, I've only read 10 pages, but I'm excited. Uh, and then, finally, another book that I have been chipping away at kind of all year, and kind of fell let fall by the wayside for the last couple of months, but I'm thinking I will try to pick up and start to read more vigorously now, is uh, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, a Norton Anthology of Native Nations Poetry, uh, which is edited by Joy Hardrow. And so I got just over 100 pages into it earlier in the year, and I would like to continue to make headway in it. I know that I will not finish it by the end of this year, but maybe if I can finish it sometime early next year, that would be great. And I haven't been reading as much poetry as I would like of late, because poetry takes a lot of headspace, and I've been lacking headspace because I've been so busy. So I'm hoping to get, in, get back into some more poetry. So anyway, that's the last book I will hopefully be making progress in. But that is everything. Uh, hopefully I made some sense. I feel very out of practice with all this. Uh, but thank you all for watching. I hope you're all having a good week. Let me know what you're reading or what you're doing and how you're doing and so on. But uh, other than that, I will let you all go.